What about the fear of death? How does this change it? Again, to me, death is when I stop experiencing. And I, I never wanted to stop. I want, I want to live forever. As I said last time, every day, the same day forever, or one day every 10 years forever, any of the forevers, I'll take it. So you want to keep getting the experiences, the new gosh, experiences. Gosh, gosh, it is, it. it is so fulfilling. Just the self-growth, the learning, the growing, the uh, comprehending. It's a, it's a, it's addictive. It's a drug. Just the drug of intellectual stimulation, the drug of growth, the, the drug of knowledge. It's a drug. But then there'll be thousands or millions of monoses that live on after your biological system is no longer. More power to them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do you think that, in quite realistically, it does mean that interesting people such as yourself live on in the, um, you know, if I can interact with the fake Manolas, those interactions live on in my mind. Does so that make sense? about 10 years ago, I started recording every single meeting that I had, every single meeting. We just start either the voice recorder at the time or now a Zoom meeting. And I record, my students record, every single one of our conversations recorded. I always joke that like the ultimate goal is to create virtual me and just get rid of me basically, not get rid of him, but like <laughs> don't have the need for me anymore. Yeah. Another goal is to be able to go back and say, how have I changed from five years ago? Mm -hmm. Was I different? Was I giving you know, advice in a different way? Was I giving different types of advice? Has my philosophy about how to write papers or how to present data or anything like that changed? And I, you know, in, in academia and in mentoring, a lot of the interaction is my knowledge and my perception of the world goes to my students. But a lot of it is also in the opposite direction. Like the other day I had a conversation with one of my postdocs and I was like, hmm, I think, you know, let me give you an advice, you could, you could do this. And then she said, well, I've thought about it. And then I've decided to do that instead. And we talked about it for a few minutes. And then at the end I'm like, you know, I've just grown a little bit today, thank you. Like she convinced me that my advice was incorrect. She, she could have just said, yeah, sounds great and just not do it. Yeah. But by constantly teaching my students and teaching my mentees that I'm here to grow, she felt empowered to say, here's my reasons why I will not follow that advice. And again, part of me growing is saying, whoa, I just understood your reasons. I think I was wrong. And now I've grown from it. And that's what I wanna do. That, I, you know, I wanna con constantly keep growing in this sort of bi-directional advice. I wonder if you can capture the trajectory of that to where the AI could also uh, map forward, project forward the trajectory after you're no longer there, how the different ways you might evolve. So again, we're, we're discussing a lot about these large language models and we're sort of projecting these cognitive states of ourselves on them. But I think on the AI front, a lot more needs to happen. So basically right now it's these language models and we believe that within their parameters, we're encoding these types of things. And you know, in some aspects it might be true, it might be truly emergent intelligence that's coming out of that. In other aspects, I think we have a ways to go. Mm -hmm. So basically to make all of these dreams that we're sort of discussing come, come reality, we basically need a lot more reasoning components, a lot more sort of logic, causality, models of the world. And I think all of these things will, will need to be there in order to achieve what we're, what we're discussing. And we need more explicit representations of these knowledge, more explicit understanding of these parameters. And, and I think the direction in which things are going right now is absolutely making that possible by sort of enabling, you know, ChatGPT and GPT-4 to sort of search the web and you know plug and play modules and all of these sort of components in uh, marvin minsky's the society of mind he, you know he truly thinks of the human brain as a society of different kind of capabilities and right now a simple a single such model might actually not capture that and i, I sort of truly believe that 
by sort of this side-by-side -side understanding of neuroscience and sort of new neural architectures that we still have several breakthroughs. I mean, the transformer model was one of them, the attention uh, sort of aspect, the you know memory component, all of these, you know, the representation learning, the pretext training of being able to sort of predict the next word or predict a missing part of the image. And the only way to predict that is to sort of truly have a model of the world. I think those have been transformative paradigms. But I think going forward, when you think about AI research, what you really want is perhaps more inspired by the brain, perhaps more that is just orthogonal to sort of how human brains work, but sort of more of these types of components. Well, it's, I think it's also possible there's something about us that uh, in different ways could be expressed. You know, Noam Chomsky, you know, he wants to, you know, we can't have intelligence unless we really understand deeply language, the linguistic underpinnings of, of, uh, of reasoning. But these models seem to start building deep understanding of stuff. Yeah. Because yeah. what, what does it mean to understand? Because if you keep talking to the thing and it seems to yeah. show understanding, that's understanding. It doesn't need to present to you a schematic of, look, yeah. this is all I understand. You can just keep prodding it with prompts and it seems to really understand. And you can go back to the human brain and basically look at places where there's been accidents. For example, the corpus callosum of uh, some individuals you know, can be damaged. And then the two hemispheres don't talk to each other. So you can close one eye and give instructions that the uh, that half the brain will interpret, but not be able to sort of pr project to the other half. And you could basically say, you know, go grab me a beer from the fridge. And then, you know, they go to the fridge and they grab the beer and they come back and they're like, hey, why did you go there? Oh, I was thirsty. Mm -hmm. Turns out they're not thirsty. They're just making a model of reality they're basically, you can think of the brain as the employee that's like afraid to do wrong or afraid to be caught not knowing what instructions were. Where our own brain makes stories about the world to make sense of the world. And we can become a little more self-aware by being more explicit about what's leading to these interpretations. So one of the things that I do is every time I wake up, I record my dream. I just voice record my dream. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I only remember the last scene, but it's an extremely complex scene with a lot of architectural elements, a lot of people, et cetera. And I will start narrating this. And as I'm narrating it, I will remember other parts of the dream. And then more and more, I'll be able to sort of retrieve from my subconscious. And what I'm doing while narrating is also narrating why I had this dream. I'm like, oh, and this is probably related to this conversation that I had yesterday, or this is probably related to the worry that I have about something that I, that I have later today, et cetera. So in a way, I'm forcing myself to be more explicit about my own subconscious. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like the concept of self-awareness in a very sort of brutal, transparent kind of way. It's not like, oh, my dreams are coming from outer space and they mean all kinds of things. Like, no, here's the reason why I'm having these dreams. And very often I'm able to do that. I have a few recurrent locations, a few recurrent architectural elements that I've never seen in the real life, but that are sort of truly there in my dream and, and that are that I can sort of vividly remember across many dreams. I'm like, ooh, I remember that place again that I've gone to before, et cetera. And, I, and it's not just deja vu. Like I have recordings of previous dreams where I've described these places. That's so interesting. These places, however much detail you could describe them in, you you can, you can place them onto a sheet of paper through introspection. Yes. Through this self-awareness that it comes all from this particular machine. That's exactly right, yeah. And I, I, I love that about being alive. Like the fact that I'm not only experiencing the world, but I'm also experiencing how I'm experiencing the world. Sort of a lot of this introspection, a lot of this self-growth. I, I love this dance we're having uh, you know, the language models, at least GPT 3.5 and 4, seem to be able to do that too. Yeah, yeah. You seem to explore different kinds of things about what, um, you know, you could actually have a discussion with it of the kind, why did you just say that? Yeah, exactly. And it starts to wonder, yeah, why did I just say that? Yeah, you're right, I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I was wrong, it was, doesn't, yeah. and, it's, there, and then there's this weird kind of 
losing yourself in the confusion of your mind. And it, of course, it might be anthropomorphizing, but there's a feeling like almost of a melancholy feeling of like, oh, I don't have it all figured out. Almost like losing your, you're supposed to be a knowledgeable, a perfectly fact-based knowledgeable language model. Yeah. And yet you fall short. <laughs> so human self-consciousness, uh, in, in my view, may have a reason through building mental models of others. This whole fight or fright kind of thing uh, that, that basically says, I interpret this person as about to attack me or you know, I can trust this person, et cetera. And we constantly have to build models of other people's intentions and that ability to encapsulate intent and to build a mental model of another entity is probably evolutionarily extremely advantageous because then you can sort of have meaningful interactions, you can sort of avoid being killed and, and, and being taken advantage of, et cetera. And once you have the ability to make models of others, it might be a small evolutionary leap to start making models of yourself. So now you have a model for how others functions and now you can kind of, as you grow, have some kind of introspection of, hmm, maybe that's the reason why I'm functioning the way that I'm functioning. And maybe what ChatGPT is doing is in order to be able to, again, predict the next word, it needs to have a model of the world. So it has created now a model of the world. And by having the ability to capture models of other entities, when you say, you know, say it in the tone of Shakespeare, in the tone of Nietzsche, et cetera, you suddenly have the ability to now introspect and say, why did you say this? Oh, now I have a mental model of myself and I can actually make inferences about that.